Hey guys, welcome to And The Writer Is. I'm your host, Ross Golan. I've written with hundreds of artists and writers over the years, and my favorite part of each session is the first hour when we catch up about life, the industry, politics, composition, whatever. So this is a journey of learning why people write songs, how people write songs, and most importantly, who the people are who write the songs. I'm producing this with the great Joe London, Big Deal Music Publishing, and Mega House Music Management. If you want to listen to the songs we discuss in this podcast, follow us on our socials, find out about special live events, or buy that merch, aka that hat I always wear, go to our website, www.andthewriteris.com. For a little bit of context, we just wanted you to know that a lot of these were recorded before quarantine. And as we know, a lot has changed in 2020. So again, please stay safe out there and enjoy the new episodes of And The Writer Is. This week's episode is sponsored by BMI. At BMI, music moves their world just like it moves mine. BMI is my performing rights organization. They're the bridge between people who create music like me and the businesses that bring it to the public. They make sure I get paid when my music is streamed on apps or shows, played on radio, at live shows, or in bars, gyms, basically anywhere where music is played. And they do this for over 900,000 songwriters, composers, and music publishers with more than 14 million songs across genres. But it's more than that. They help us navigate the music industry, they create opportunities for aspiring writers and composers through stages at festivals, song camps, and workshops. And they connect us with the right people. They're also on Capitol Hill fighting for copyright protection and fair royalties. And they work hard to ensure the future of music. They have my back and they'll have yours. Learn more at BMI.com. Welcome to And The Writer Is. I am your host, Ross Golan. Today's songwriting community staple is the spark that has blown up a number of artists' careers for the past 20 years. People like Avril Lavigne, Jason Mraz, Hilary Duff, g Easy, and BB Rexa, they all owe her for their breakout hits. Having been a major label artist herself, she has been unafraid to get in the trenches. She won BMI Songwriter of the Year in 2004, has been nominated like, what, seven times? Won an Ivor Novello, and had multiple number one smashes. She's innovative and she's an advocate for the next generation musician from London, England. This spiritually fulfilled humans entrepreneurial entrepreneurial am, I'll do, do that again. From London, England, this spiritually fulfilled humans entrepreneurial ambition is infectious. One of my faves and the writer is my friend Lauren Christie. Hi, Ross. Thank uh, you so much. That was beautiful. <laughs> that's really funny. You know, it's, we just started filming these, so that's going to be much harder to edit on film. Some people are going to see it differently than they're going to hear it, I think. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, we were saying before that a lot of these interviews are different. If, if I've never met them before, then it's really mm-hmm. just sort of a blind date interview kind of thing. But it's different when you actually have a relationship. That's it. Um, but one of the other things that's kind of cool about the doing the podcast is that you're in in normal sessions you talk about how things are currently but you rarely go through their entire life and get to know who they were before anybody in this industry met them mm-hmm. so you know i usually like to start in the beginning so uh okay uh as we say you were born that's right okay okay summer Where? of love <laughs> 67 yeah? okay in uk south london uh-huh uh-huh. Croydon, Shirley Croydon, Surrey, to be exact. Who Who are your parents? My dad, Brian Founds, was a comedian. And my mom, stay-at-home mom, Marilyn. Um, my dad, his first marriage kind of suffered because he was always on the road. And I have a wonderful brother and sister, Sharon and Stephen, from that marriage. Um, so when he met my mom, he decided to let go of the comedy because it entailed a lot of traveling and late nights. And uh, he... Did you ever get to see him perform? Well, many times, but probably not 
professionally uh-huh. at every family event. Um, my that was his actual my dad's job. hilarious. Yeah, he worked for, he opened for Shirley Bassey at the Palladium in London right before TV really took off. And um, when my father... Did he tell like one-line jokes or oh, was it sort was, of long story? What was he his was the, style? He was hailed as the youngest comedian in Britain because he started when he was 16 professionally. And th- there's a lot of similarities between songs and jokes. Yeah, there is. There's a, there's a beginning, yeah. middle, and end. Yeah. And my know, dad always a, said, a point. laughter is the world's best medicine, and we literally live by that in our house. you got to laugh every day. Did, did he play music too? My dad could play a bit of guitar and sing, and my mom could sing a bit, and they would always at the family events, be, she'd sit on his knee and they'd play these songs from New Zealand. My mom's from New Zealand, actually. And she moved over to London and met my dad when she was 24. Um, did they write songs together or no. it was always covers? No, it was always just covers of other people's stuff. But my dad was a fan that, of music. At that point, it's just everyone's just playing Beatles and Rolling Stones songs or were they, <laughs> or was this sort of... Not really, they missed know. the 60s. My parents, funny enough, my dad was 16 years older than my mom and he um, was, more, they were more like a 50s couple, actually. Oh, yeah. My mom was so much younger that she kind of pulled to his genre. So we missed the Stones in our house and the Beatles, you know. The first stuff I was really into was like Bowie and Blondie and oh, cool. stuff like that. I, I literally didn't get to have the 60s in my house. Did you know you, you would be a performer from an early age? Yeah. Because obviously performing is a big thing in your family. So It really is. So I guess what happened was my father, because he quit doing what he really, really loved, which was performing, he instilled in my younger brother Brandon and I this absolute drive to perform and to create and be, um, you know, words. And he, he would drive around with me. He would drive me to school sometimes or to auditions when I was a dancer. And he would um, always play me country and western music, all the greats all the best. So, And he would say, listen to the lyrics, listen to the story. And that's how I started to fall in love with songs, was his love of country music. Two questions. One is, did Brandon, is he still doing music? Yeah. Did- My brother Brandon followed me out to LA when I came here when I was 23. I got a, lucky enough to get a record deal with Mercury Records, Tom Vickers, Ed Eckstein, got to mention them. John Carter, I've got to mention too. Um, and so my brother came out and he is a brilliant musician. He can play piano so, so beautifully. And I've worked with him many times over the years. But he actually did the theme tune for Access Hollywood. Whoa. And it was like so a he's just still catching piano. hit every yeah. year for my brother. <laughs> wow. And, um, and it, I think it, it went on as the theme tune for about 17 years. And recently he's now working full time at Song Trader, which is a company he helped start with some friends. I don't know if you've heard of Song Trader. I don't know. What is that? It's a music licensing company, yeah. sync company, um, kind of many people can join and they, they get your stuff on TV. It's really great. Did you want to do country music if your dad was playing? Were you like, I'm going to be... Not you know? really. Not really. I was like a huge Kate Bush, um, Blondie, The Police. Did your dad get those that music or not? No, not at all. That was the, the my, my music. Your, rebel- your rebellion <laughs> yeah. was yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, did you... How did you get into the idea of actually creating music? So when... So my idea was... My big dream was to be a ballet dancer when I was young. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And then I think I put it on my bio. The, the truth is I found a, a piano buried in my back garden when I was five years old when we were trying to build a, pl- a climbing frame in the back garden. And when we were like digging with the gardeners to try Found an old piano? A grand piano under the lawn. Yeah. What? Yeah. And so I was obsessed with the piano from an early age and started playing. And I was doing ballet very seriously. But I just loved playing the piano, doing piano lessons. And then... What kind I of thought, were you playing classical music oh, stuff that you would do? Yeah, ballet classical to? stuff that yeah that we would learn. And also, I also figured out that I could take Elton John songs and I could just read the chord symbols off all. I buy the, the sheet yeah. music, and I may have not been good enough to play all the notes, right. but I could read the chord symbols and just sing the songs at the piano. Um, but anyway, I I packed up my bags and I went to boarding school at eleven to study ballet at the school called Bush Davies theatrical school of arts and we did all forms of dance but primarily ballet and my first week there I met my friend Michelle who I still know today she's a great friend and her dad was Tony Hatch 
who wrote Downtown for Petula Clark Whoa. and Don't Sleep Under the Subway Baby. And I was like, you mean that's a job, being a songwriter? And she said, yeah, that's what my dad does. And that was how it started for me. Michelle and I started playing song, writing songs in all the ballet studios. There was like 10 studios there. And so before class, I'd show up 20 minutes early and sit there playing the piano when I'm meant to be warming up. And what did Michelle do in that? Michelle and I, she was just like, hey, this is how, you know, this is what we should do. And she, she's such a character. She didn't end up in music. Um, she went more into acting and performing. Um, but I, it stuck with me. I was like, I love this. So much of what we have to do is, is you know, show that you can be a professional mm -hmm. musician. I mean, I think a lot of people think arts means that there's less stability. Mm -hmm. But it just makes you an entrepreneur. You know, it's just That's as true. unstable as any other entrepreneurial efforts. Absolutely. You know, if you want to start any company, mm -hmm. you're just as a songwriter, that's your company. Yeah. And so it helps when you get to know somebody who actually survived being a. <laughs> I'm a musician. amazed. I always thank yeah. God every day because I left school at 16. I you, didn't, you finished? I finished. I packed up and left and said, that's it. I'm going into. Did you graduate? Uh, yeah, yeah I, I I did my basic form, yeah. um, GCSEs in England and and an art O level I got a B in very proud Perfect. of that but it was not my focus I had a horrible so what learning do? disability when what I was, was young that? dyslexia just not yeah. being able to to Amen. see the words yeah. <laughs> backwards sure. basically so then at sixteen you you still have a few years before you move to. Yes, LA. yeah. So what happens between then and when you moved to LA? So I, first of all, I was in a band and that was just too tough after about a year. I was like, no, that's not happening. I kept writing songs. I just, I, I think I joined another band. I was like, how am I going to do this? And um, then I did some demos and my ex-husband and I were working together. And At that time? At that time. So you and, were really young when you got uh, married? Um, I was 19. Wow. Yeah. So between 16 and 19, I was just putting in my time sure. being in bands and living the life and w teaching dance to, to teaching tap dancing to make money, um, which I could still do you if I have to tap? go back to it. Yeah, that's the plan. Do you yeah. do that in sessions? Do you ever just whip I, out I love some, to whip out a triple some, time step yeah, whenever right. I can. Yeah. Well, now <laughs> that we're filming some of these, maybe we should maybe, actually. Maybe. I yeah. don't mind. Let's do it. Um, so, so we get to, I did some demos. I met my ex-husband who was the bass player in Adam and the Ants. Whoa. Yeah. Graham Edwards. Super okay. talented. Super talented songwriter too. I'm hanging out with my friend Michelle. Her dad's listening to my demos and he offers me a publishing deal. Tony Hatch. After all these years, my inspiration, it was, it was pretty amazing. And, um, my ex-husband, Graham, said, hang on a second, let me call my friend Alan Jacobs at EMI and see if he, he would like to meet you. And of course, I was just blown away. EMI? Oh, my goodness. And so I went and had this meeting with Alan, and I thought it went so badly, but he called me up and said, I want to sign you. And that was the beginning of my really being a professional. At 19, they signed me to EMI as a songwriter. And then you said, well, I also want to be... Well, you weren't writing for other people really at that time, right? You were no, writing for yourself. No, well, the thing is, is that I didn't really know that that was a thing. Right. So I just had to be the singer. Yeah. And so I thought, okay, I'll try and do like a it's Kate It's the Bush. curse of being a good singer when you're younger too, is that somebody says that <laughs> you should be the artist and not this is a tool for you to use yeah. in many ways. I didn't know that. You know? I yeah. just thought that I had to be the artist. And so I, I did that. And, um, and after a couple of years of really just trying to... I, I got signed to Atlantic Records. John Carter signed me. And he never met me. It was an incredible thing. He just what? signed me from, from L.A. without just hearing my demos and seeing pictures and talking on the phone to me. And no sooner had he signed me and we were halfway through the record, they fired everybody at Atlantic. And so I'd lost my A&R guy. This is like, like such a long story. But no, it's good. <laughs> so anyway, after, after two years of being stuck on Atlantic with a half-finished record... I wrote to Doug Morris a personal letter begging him to release me. And by this time, I'd met this wonderful guy, Tom Vickers and Ed Eckstein, and they were willing to purchase me off Atlantic. 
But I just couldn't get off the label because no one would answer any of our calls. And, you know, you could get lost in the shuffle there yeah. in the lawyer's office. So I ended up writing a letter to Doug Morris and FedExing it to him. This is a long time ago. And he wrote back to me and they released me and I got signed to Mercury Records. And then Tom and Ed brought me out to L.A. when I was 23. And that was the beginning. But if such a long time of from 16 to 23 of just thinking, I think I may be doing the wrong thing here. Yeah. yeah. It, in 1994, you is this right? That you get nominated for Best New Artist for AMAs yeah. as a solo artist? Yes. Yeah. So you actually started really succeeding as a as a solo artist in the United States. Or was this a worldwide No, it was it, here in the States and Canada. And Mercury were fantastic. They instead of sending me on a tour bus, they let me just fly in everywhere with my band. And uh, they would joke, they'd call me the Grace Kelly of rock and roll because I didn't have to do all the tour bus stuff. <laughs> That's amazing, though. It was awesome. We flew all over the place and I had three top 10 AC hits. And the record I made was very soft and, and poetic and at exactly the same time, Nirvana hit. <laughs> huh. yeah. Of course, I was like so into it. But that's I not really how I, I, I'm like, I shoot, what am I doing? That that's not really the vibe that you. I mean, I know it ends up being almost ten years later, but that's not really the vibe that I would describe the songwriting that you do. It's this sort of soft, you know. I think you, my I voice is some... quite mellow, so and I was really inspired by Kate Bush, and so I was. I thought that's the kind of record I'm going to make. It's some more more Sarah McLaughlin-y, I would sure. say. You know, I mean, you were on some big, some pretty yeah. big albums as a solo artist. I know, obviously, that you see the Batman and Robin soundtrack and stuff, <laughs> which at the time that was a huge movie. It and was, the, and the soundtrack probably was multi platinum and all these things. It was. Why did you stop? Being a, an artist. So um, but the first album did really okay, you know, um, but I had I also got a Golden Globe nomination for the song The Color of Night from the movie with Bruce Willis. Wow. So I had all these great things happening. I made the second record. The album was called Breed because I wanted to have kids. And that's the truth. I really wanted to have kids. I've just It's always been in me that I wanted to have babies. And so I made this album Breed. Everyone thought it was going to be a smash. The song Breeds in Batman. That, do, do you have children? I do. I have two daughters. Uh, I actually have four daughters. Okay. With my right. new husband in total. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, two biologically for me, 19 cool. and 17. Yeah. Yeah. So it worked. Yeah. You just had to write an album about it. Uh, well, yeah. And so anyway, the, the record just took a dive. Mm -hmm. um, this is unfortunate. My song Breed, everyone thought it was going to be a huge smash. And at the same time, Meredith Brooks comes out with Bitch. And honestly, it was just fantastic. I love that song. And my song was really good too, but it just, it didn't compete. And so honestly, after that, I think my record label was scratching their head. What do we do? And I had made a bit of a left turn. The problem with being a songwriter, I like all genres of music. And so being an artist who's a songwriter, you, you don't necessarily want to stay in your lane. So my second album was definitely more rock compared to the first one, which was more Sarah McLachlan. And so um, after that second album, I just felt, uh-oh, this isn't going to happen for me as an artist. And I really want to have kids. And I was flying every two or three days around America doing concerts and I opened at Red Rocks for Kenny Loggins. Crazy stuff. I opened for Kenny G in, in Atlanta at the Chastain Park, I think it's called. It's so beautiful. Just I'd got to do some incredible stuff. I got all my yayas out of wanting to be an artist, really. And um, after I was being managed by some wonderful guys who managed Fleetwood Mac and they said, you know, okay, let's go and get another record deal. Um, I remember flying to London to meet an A&R guy to play him some of my new demos. I'm 29 years old and I'm just, I just kind of felt it in my heart. This isn't going to happen. And they asked me for the songs for another artist. Who was the artist? Uh, one of the songs was for Natalie Ambulia. It didn't oh. end up happening, but I remember oh. flying back from London and on the plane saying, I'm done with being an artist. Yeah. I'm not going to feel sad about this. Yeah. I'm done. And... Very inspired by a guy called Max Martin and this little company called Sharon. Mm. I said, I want to do what he's doing. And so I got off the plane. My husband picked me up. And I said, let's, let's just form a company and let's go behind the scenes. He was in a band called Doll's Head. 
Um, I can't remember the label now, it's too long ago. And he was feeling the same thing. Like we were both a bit sick of doing the artist thing. So we started The Matrix and I got pregnant. Well, that's strange timing to start a company and also... Exactly. It was completely but crazy. I know I know people <laughs> who say that when they when they're pregnant or after they have a baby, um, whatever it is, having a child really changes how you write. And maybe ambition in a way. I mean, male or female. I just find that when they realize that they have to work for somebody else, you know, in the future of somebody else, that the whole thing changes. And clearly, starting the matrix, you know, that's a whole yeah. other thing. So yeah. I assume that Scott and Graham, your co-writers, um, how soon after you guys are, I'm going to start the, we're going to start the matrix. You're pregnant. Are you thinking, oh, we're going to hit the ground running really hard? Is it, or was it sort of, oh, this is just what we're calling Actually, no, no. We hit the ground really, really hard because I was so terrified. I was at $180,000 worth of debt at the time. What? And I'm pregnant. Why Why so much debt? Just, I don't know. I just, you know, I had never really made it as an artist, I felt. Like I'd had all these close but no cigar moments. Yeah. And Mercury were so kind to always be looking after me every year but that I'd never really managed to get rid of some debt that I had. Yeah. You know? And uh, so it was a really scary time. And so when The Matrix started, it was just like, okay, let's go to work. Yeah, let's nothing really like go that to, work. to get somebody oh, yeah. to write fast. Yeah. Um, you end up with, you know, I, that first year, two, 2000 of you guys being together, 1999, 2000, you know. So, I mean, the songs that come out in 2000 are probably written in 99, give or take, some of them, you know. Mm-hmm. Um it's really sort of, you know, these ones aren't getting you out of debt no, either. No, no, You know, I mean, there, it's more just a proof of concept is sort of what yeah. it seems. You know, I right. mean, Christina Aguilera is obviously a really big name that you ended up having right in the prime and it's her Christmas song, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, is that sort of, were people looking for, oh, you guys are a real team because you guys are the ones who've now... Especially if Sharon had done a lot of the Britney Backstreet, yeah. you know, and sync, then that means that you writing with someone like Christina Aguilera in the year two thousand is a is, must be a big deal. It was that was a really big deal for us, and you know, we called the Matrix that name, nothing to do with the movie, because six months before that movie came out, but we decided it would be like the Matrix means the womb, if you look it up, and huh. um, uh, and so we thought it would be a, a cool place that people could come and incubate their projects. And we ended up working with a lot of wonderful artists. Some of them never saw the light of day. And we would just be in there uh, at the studio just trying to figure out what their sound was. And, no, you know, didn't we didn't have to write a song that day. We'd even just talk about it. And so people could kind of incubate their ideas with us. That's really cool. Yeah. Did, did you do... That explains why you end up working with so many artists early on in their mm. careers. Um you know, you, if you're $180,000 in debt mm-hmm. and you guys start this new company, it still takes a time for you guys to be incubated as a company. Yeah, so and, it still and takes, we had out costs. We bought a lot of gear and we... Um, who's you know, funding that? We who's, did ourselves. We took oh out man. loans. Uh, we it, we literally, it was a leap it of faith. It was all or nothing. It was a leap of faith. Yeah. It's shit or bust, literally. That's why I'm, <laughs> I'm getting more and more pregnant. I got signed to a, a, a nice deal, Warner's deal, with um, Kenny McPherson and those guys. Nice. It was it was really cool. And uh, and we were just keeping our head above water, but starting to to do good. Uh, we had like some B-sides on uh, Ronan Keating. Uh, and just just cool little things were happening, but nothing major. But I we got out of debt, to put it that yeah. way. You know, so it was well, as, two as years pro- of really hard work producing. And a production company, you're actually making some money on the productions, not just on the songs. Absolutely. So Back in those days. Yeah. Yeah. I like that you guys split production and songwriting. Mm-hmm. I don't. What was the dynamic between the three of you guys? Who did what? Well, pretty much we all. I mean, Scott was a really, really amazing technical person and could play piano. I did a lot of the recording of the vocals. For instance, like all the Avril vocals, I recorded, comped, tuned, consolidated, uh, all the corn vocals I recorded. Um, Graham was really amazing at working with live players. 
like there'd, there'd be a band who'd come in. They have all this stuff, but they hadn't really got it together. And we'd we'd routine them, we'd rehearse them in the mm. studio for two weeks before even going in to record the album. And uh, Graham would be very much involved with that stuff. Um, this band, the Mooney Suzuki, we actually recorded the whole thing live down at Paramount, like a Who record. Nothing, nothing on, um, nothing sequenced. Everything just. How's working like, with someone you're married with? Well, I mean, we're not married anymore. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but we're very good friends. We were together 23 years, and he's very talented, a brilliant songwriter. Um, he's, I always say he was like a golden goose with melodies, <laughs> and um, just very talented. Uh, he's the best guitarist, best bass player. Um, I couldn't say nicer things about him, really, but sometimes we would sort of turn over to each other in bed and say, about that bridge... Oh, it's man. just wrong. And I'm like, oh, no. You know, after after years and years and years, I think we're just too much working together. You know, it's it's really nice. My husband, I've been, my new husband, Lawrence, I've been with him 10 years now. Yeah. And he's not in the music business, but he really loves music. He does. So yeah. it's refreshing. Every couple of weeks I'll say, baby, do you want to hear some music? And uh, we'll just like play it. And he's he's just so, such a great listener. And I love it. He's such a great support. 2002, it sort of all changes. Yeah. Because you have this whole, even whatever you had done as a solo artist mm -hmm. up until then, all the touring, all that, you still see you're an opening act for some bigger names that are playing it, and mm -hmm. you're seeing it so closely. All of that being a success, mm -hmm. in my opinion, there's still not quite the same thing as as a success like what you end up with Avril Lavigne and Jason Mraz all mm -hmm. in the same year. So here you are incubating all these artists yeah. and then, you know, the remedy for Jason Mraz, which really defines him, mm -hmm. you know, um, what is it like for you to have been through the struggle thus far and then having those both hit pretty much the exact same time and Avril, I mean, complicated skater boy, anything but ordinary. They're all they're big songs. Certainly, complicated and skater boy are like mm -hmm. iconic for that era. What's it like to have four huge songs in a year? It was incredible, absolutely incredible. I really thought I was going to have to quit doing this. I'd actually applied to become a paramedic, you know, <laughs> before the Matrix started. I was like, this maybe not working out for me. This music thing. So when Avril hit, it was just incredible. I remember turning uh, TRL on in the studio. I don't know if anyone remembers that, but it was the show in, on MTV and seeing Avril on there and all the kids singing Complicated. And in that moment, I think I just went, wow, everything's going to be okay. I can do this. Yeah. And, and then it kept going. It was a, cr a crazy thing to have one number one and then we actually had three back to back. Yeah. And those days, songs would be number one for... 10 or 12, 16 weeks. So it was a whole year of being number one. No, that's, <laughs> it was incredible. I don't know if that's... I'm I don't, so grateful. I don't know, know if that's true. I don't think that... Then there were also songs that probably blipped up to number one or got close, but great songs had that run then. And great songs now kind of have that run. That's true. It, I think that it's shortchanging yourself to think that at that era other songs were doing that. No, your songs were doing that. That's a huge. <laughs> it's a huge difference because I think people think of the past sometimes as it being either easier or harder or whatever it was. But no, it was it was co competitive and difficult. It was hard to get to number one then, just like it is now. And songs now also don't last for very long and mm -hmm. they didn't then either just your songs did so well just, thank you thank you that's yeah. very nice of you to say I mean you know it, it I was I was mind blown honestly it's it saved us it it set set us up um, the Avril record was just a huge blessing what did it continues your, to be what did people in the UK you know one thing where you're sharing it with the two people that you're writing with every day mm -hmm. and then you see these artists on TV um it's another thing for, you know, for your home town or your home family yeah. to to start seeing success. Did they understand the level? Was it translating in the UK? Um 
Well, I mean, my brother, Brandon, he would always just say to me, guys, your music's so good. It's going to be successful. And whenever I'd be kind of doubting, he would just say to me, Lauren, keep going. It's so good what you're doing. And so my family's always been like that. My my sister Sharon and my brother Stephen, they have always just cheered me on. So when it happened, they were like, yes, about time, literally, because they all thought, well... Lauren's really trying to make it, poor thing. She's still going. She's 33. She's pregnant. So when it just hit, they were like, yes, yeah. we knew you could do it. We always knew, yeah. Yeah. During this time, you end up becoming kind of the voice of what you would think of as pop music. I mean, Nick Lachey, Hilary Duff, which we'll get to next, you know, you end up really... You're still doing things like corn on the side. When did, when did corn come out? Well, that ca- actually, we did that in 2004. For, because we did so many female artists, Liz Fair, Hillary. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, Liz right. is also somebody who's a little bit left. She's a little more left than, than yeah, the other Yeah, of course, artists, I love that. You know? Yeah, of course. But these these artists that you're working with are the, they they really defined the next era of pop. You right, know? right. Um, is there... Why even push the envelope if you become sort of the envelope? Like why <laughs> why go over to Liz Fair and Corn and do some of this left of center if you are doing so well on Nick Lachey, Avril, Jason Mraz at the time, you know? Well, I, I feel actually at the time when I think back to it, we were a little concerned about just being pigeonholed as the people who did female pop. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what we were primarily getting known for. And so we decided to take a left turn and do Liz Fair and the Mooney Suzuki and then Corn. You know, yeah. we spent a long time with Corn. We did two albums back to back. So crazy. I mean, so uh, what made them, I know this, I mean this in the nice way, but what made them want to work with you guys? Um, the way it was put to us was they were interested after, I think, making six albums in total and at the end of the deal of shaking things up um, and trying to work with some people that are completely out of their ballpark. So they, I think they worked with Glenn Ballard. Yeah. Us. I think they might have worked with Linda too. Um, we went in there thinking, what on earth are we doing here? And at first, the first day, it was didn't go well at all. <laughs> they were just looking at us and we were looking at them. And then finally we said, how about you guys go and play and we'll record you? And so that's that's what they did. And they sound incredible with all their detune guitars and stuff we basically recorded them took the stuff back to our studio and then chopped everything up and kind of assembled a song together and went back the next day and we we brought them the beginning idea of Twisted Transistor and I remember going up to Jonathan saying what do you think of this and we've got three weeks free we were all about to take a three week break and I just thought you know what I'm just going to throw it out there. And they called us that night and said, we want to come in and work with you for three weeks. And we went in the studio. We cut 23 songs in oh, that period, oh. just recording them live. And uh, where did these songs, were you writing them and recording writing them? Writing and in- recording them all on the spot with the band. It was the most amazing experience. Jonathan's actually a great friend of mine. I love those guys. Head had just left the band at the time. He'd become a born-again Christian. Um, we, we all became pals and we just had this amazing creative experience and ended up with most of that that record see you on the other side and then as soon as that was finished we just did another one they had coming undone twisted transistor some some big hits for them this week's episode is sponsored by bmi full disclosure joe and i are both bmi songwriters so we didn't write this but we believe it BMI, we celebrate your talent, value your music, and champion your rights. To all our songwriters and composers, your passion is ours. BMI, music moves our world. How, um, how routine did songwriting become after, at this point, if you start writing songs all the time and you're writing, you know, the, you, just so many songs coming out every mm-hmm. year. Mm-hmm. All different kinds of artists, a lot of pop, but you know, clearly you guys were trying to do some stuff that were outside of the pop stuff. Mm-hmm. How much of it became routine? And you know, were your expectations ever at a certain level of success, having had four number one songs in a row or whatever it was? 
Um, yeah, I mean, we were working six days a week. I had two yeah. little little children as well at home. So it was a crazy whirlwind. But again, you know when you've got to step up because yeah. you're musicians and, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so it just became routine but also very exciting because we kept shaking it up all the time we were always trying to do a, a different genre let's do this this day and then let's switch it up to to shakira on another day and, sure you know i it's i started getting involved in co-writing around 2007 or 8 i think that's the first time i ever really did it and one of the first co-writers i had was faras mm, and I love faras who great writer did a lot of the recent Katy Perry songs. Um, amazing piano player, amazing singer. And you guys did Incredible. Hollywood's Not America. And I just remember thinking at that point is we were trying so hard to sound like you guys. You know, the Matrix <laughs> were the people who had the sound. It was, you know, you guys and then Dr. Luke's group. And yeah. it was sort of like these two camps mm -hmm. of people doing stuff. Did you feel like there was... Did you ever feel competitive with other camps in in the... Absolutely. And our manager at the time was absolutely egging us on to be in competition with everybody. And you, and also when you've been so successful suddenly and so broke before, yeah. <laughs> you, you just feel very competitive. Yeah. Um, and you basically just want to work hard. Yeah. You know? I just wanted to always take my A game in. Um, just... Someone said at, at Busby's celebration that Busby would always have a song up his sleeve before he showed up for a session or a great chorus. We always had that. We would always meet an hour before the session and pretty much have something. Sure. You don't want to be rude to an artist and write a whole song, but yeah. we would have something just out of respect for the artist that we felt like at least we've listened to all your music and kind of worked out where we think you should be going and, you know, how about this? People talk about how someday somebody's going to sample one of your songs and so that's why you want to stay own your copyrights or whatever. But rarely do people actually cover songs or sample songs that are, you know, pop hits. Um, Rihanna samples one of your songs in Cheers, Drink to That. Mm -hmm. The Rihanna's, bit from I'm With You. Yeah. Yeah. And it's such a... Big. Um, first of all, it was a six-eight song that they sampled in a four-four song, which yeah. is already bizarre. <laughs> but Rihanna was just hit after hit after hit after hit at this point. Um, I've never experienced having somebody actually cover a song and then having that become a hit itself. Sometimes it ends up on on an album track. How does it feel, or what is it like to hear a song? Appropriated is that the right? Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, it's just a wonderful gift. And did Rihanna, you hear it before it came out? Did you um, know it was they, happening? They, had, they cleared it with us before, and you know, made and actually gave us a piece of the publishing. Um, and it was just wow, Rihanna's going to do this! How awesome! It was incredible. Yeah, it was just a pure, pure joy. BMI award, I'm sure. Um, I don't know. Maybe. I'm not sure about that. That's yeah, should be. <laughs> um. When does The Matrix stop? The last work we did was 2012. And why? I mean, I think after 13 years going hard, you know, six days a week, we achieved a lot of our dreams. It just, you know, I went through a divorce <laughs> with yeah. Graham. Um, being, you know, I think everybody, it just ran its course. How was being a, um, you know, you, all this work and you still manage to have two children during that? Um, it's hard enough to be a human in this business, but to be a mom sounds like, you know, superhero status <laughs> amount of focus. How did you do that? Well, my mom and dad are amazing. and um, They moved out. Actually, my dad got dementia. So my mom, it was a big thing. We needed them to come out here so that we could make sure my dad was was okay and that mom had help looking after. But she was incredible helping me with the kids. And I always had a deal with my daughters that if you're sick 
and you want mommy to stay home, I'm staying home. I don't care who I'm working with. Yeah. And um, I guess that's a great thing of being in a team that if ever anything happened like that, like one yeah. of my kids got the flu, that was it. I wasn't going to be there. And so that that's one of the things. We, we also were pretty routine. Like we worked from 10 to 7 every day, um, six days a week. And then eventually it started to drop to like five days a week. But that's how I did it, just having a wonderful team, having the family. My aunt from Burbank was very much involved with my children's life. And... You why know. didn't you? Why after the Matrix stops? Why don't you guys all retire? Um, well, to be honest, I thought about it because ban- I was bands a- break up after yeah. after that kind of length, and they don't necessarily go and start a new band. They don't necessarily go start writing for other people. They, I know. Why I know. not? Why not retire? I thought about it because I kind of felt like maybe like the marriage had suffered because of working so hard, and you know, but. It's like everyone who's a songwriter knows this. It's just in your blood. You can't not do it. It's yeah. music just pours out of you. In fact, if I if if three days go by and I haven't really done anything, I start to feel a little sick. And I think everyone can relate to that. <laughs> so uh, Donna called me, Donna Kassane, who I work with so closely at Reservoir. Donna's my girl. I love yeah, her. Yeah, she's incredible. Yeah, she's been Great my publisher, publisher for years. So Donna called me and said, can you go to an Acon session tonight with this guy, DJ Frankie? And I was like, sure. I ran down there and uh, and we we wrote a hit. And it was Tonight I'm Loving You for Enrique. And it went to number one. Yeah, I was like, song. and it happened so fast. I don't think I'd ever have had a song that you write and then it's in on the radio in like four or five weeks. It's later. such a big song. Yeah, with Jacob Luttrell, I've got to mention him. Yeah, And uh, so... Yeah, when that happened, it was incredible. It was different to not be a producer on a, yeah. a track. DJ Frankie produced it. And it was just an incredible blessing. Yeah, I mean, it's such a big song. And again, this is one of those things where it comes out and then every, you know, there's a, a bunch of people are following, oh, this is probably something that we should start writing like or for or whatever, you know. Um I mean, there's a lot of stuff between that and me, myself, and I. But mm-hmm. uh, the, I'm always interested in that space between hits. Mm-hmm. You know, what happened during that time. And there's still, you know, three years, four years or something between that and me, myself, and I. Mm-hmm. I threw myself into just being a writer because I was like, what am I going to do? You know, my girls are in school. I do the, the, the mommy thing, picking them up and stuff. But I've still got a lot of time on my hands. So I just thought, go be a writer. I'll just pop in and uh, be a butterfly to different sessions, you know, of producers and just go in and write hooks. And Did you ever doubt yourself in any of it? Um, well, yeah, I had to tell you, I became a Christian around the same time that Tonight I'm Loving You came out. Are, are those, is that a coincidence? Uh were you not or did really. you turn did you become a Christian before or after that? I was gonna ask you about spiritualism I would say, after, but yeah, so let's let's, <laughs> let's well, intertwine. Two thousand nine so, yeah. I became a Christian, born okay. again. And um it's something funny happens when you when you become a Christian, at least it did for me, you just have a bit more confidence. I didn't really, before I was just like, oh my God, can I do this? Can I do this? Oh, wow, I can do this. And uh, once I became a Christian, I was like, no, I can do this. I'll be fine. Yeah. It's just the quiet confidence that I have now, thank God. (laughs) Yeah. And so, yeah, I threw myself into writing and going up to Atlantic. I think I probably met you in those days. Um, I was, uh, um, someone said to me, oh, Lauren, you're just, you're crazy. You're just running around town, just writing so many songs. And, I didn't really know what else to do, you know, because I was, this is my whole life and what am I going to do? I'm just going to keep having fun and writing songs. And to me, it's, it's a collaborative process. It's so fun and I just needed to do it. Sure. So I kept going. Uh, when Me, Myself and I hits, and it had been a, a minute since you had had that big of a hit. And yeah. It's a big hit for anybody at any time in their career. But, um, Working with BB, friend of the podcast. Yes. Um, you know, doing, working in hip hop, really sort of like the first rapper that you had a collaboration with, I believe. Or at least I, on that level, right? I think so. You know, it's a, how much of that song, I, the original song was just you and BB, correct? And, and then TMS. It was, 
and TMS. The, the production team but from UK. It was yeah. a song for BB, and then this, the, yeah. then they, G E Z heard it, and then put new verses on it. Right. Yes, that's right. Um, how much of the process were you involved in once you wrote the song? Not too much. We wrote the song on the piano, and uh, the next thing I, th- I guess BB went and played it to to G E Z. And it was taken away from us. And the funny thing is, when we first heard it, we were like, oh, that's not going to work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's not going to work. And uh, and then we just watched it fly all the way up the charts. It was incredible. And you know why I enjoyed that song so much? It was because my daughters were finally old enough to be in the car and listen to a song that I'd written and just go, wow, mommy, your song's on the on the radio again. It was really awesome. They really enjoyed it. All their friends loved that song. Personally, I love that song too. It's, yeah. it's spiritual. To yeah. me, it's really spiritual. And we, we poured our hearts out into it. Yeah. Working with Dua Lipa, who's now maybe the biggest mm-hmm. pop star, one of them in the, mm-hmm. in the world. And, and so you're still working with, you're still the incubator. <laughs> I love it. I love to help people figure out what they want to do. So I realized finally I'm actually quite shy. I was never really probably meant to be an artist up front because I like to be in behind the scenes and helping other people figure out what they're going to go out and do on the Grammys. You know, you could write with so many people that are established, and you still choose to find that new voice, the new ones. Yeah, I love it. It's more exciting. Yeah. It's, it's scarier though on some uh, maybe not now but it seems scarier to have it where the the floor is so much lower with an unknown artist and you know Dua who, when we all met Dua is signed to an A&R person who's no longer at the label it's it's a label that was not working at the time didn't have any hits and you know we all wrote with her because she's a new artist who's willing to co-write and to her credit she's willing to take outside songs she's willing to co-write she's a great curator she's you know but it's just interesting the idea of of working with a uh, a new artist when you have the the ins for bigger artists and i i mm-hmm. think i think on some people the assumption is that they can't get into the rooms with the rihannas but you could have gotten in the room with Rihanna when she didn't have any hits. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? A lot of a lot of writers have this assumption that you know when you're a successful writer, then that means you're only writing with successful artists, and you're yeah. not. You're writing with new artists. Yeah, it's to, to be honest, it's a little more exciting to me to take right. somebody from who's trying to figure out what they want to do. Sure. And um, obviously, maybe not. You know, it's more of a risk. But yeah, I've always been obviously, as you know, a risk taker, and. I just, I'm really doing it for the music. I yeah. love doing music. I like that, you know, you have a lot of songs that came out with the Struts in the last couple of years. And, you know, to have a, and, and back, you said you're back working with Corn. You're still working on different kinds of music and yeah. whatnot. But one thing that I thought was really fun was, you know, we, we had both had a song on the Avril Lavigne album this year. Yes. But you, to bookend the last you know, your songwriting career in a mm-hmm. way, mm-hmm. your outside songwriting career with Avril, what's it like to work with her again, having seen her whole arc from the beginning till now? It was so beautiful to reunite with her. We're, we're sisters, we really are. And uh, the first album was an incredible experience. Often then to just sit together and write songs like we were at the beginning, it was full a full circle for, moment for me and really incredible. Yeah. I thank God for that moment. Two things that we we used to, you know, I remember talking to you where you were looking for a new publishing deal. This was mm-hmm. around me, myself, and I. Mm-hmm. And you were looking at innovative ways to have your own publishing agreement. <laughs> you were like, well, nobody really does this, and I don't want to give any details or anything. But you were choosing to push your own limits and the industry limits and how to address a relationship with you versus saying, oh, well, this is how it's done. So I'm going to, I'm looking for, uh, I'm looking for a publishing deal was not what you were looking for. You were looking for a specific deal yeah. that had certain requirements for you. Mm-hmm. Um, why not, why not just go with the flow? Why push back? Um, 
why create not why why create your own lane in the music industry on that that side? I mean, this isn't the same thing as negotiating for one or one MDRC too many or too little or anything like that. It's not that. It's that you're choosing to do innovative things with your own career. Mm-hmm. Why? I think that there was a feeling I had when I would take a big advance of kind of, you know, I'm a, I'm a workaholic, so I, I immediately feel like, oh, well, I've got to, to pay all the money back. And I didn't particularly like that feeling. And um, so I wanted to do something innovative where it was more of a partnership. Yeah. And they saw me more as a, like a, a sports player and they wanted me on their team. Yeah. And that's what I ended up doing with, with Reservoir, with, with Donna Kassane and Golna. Yeah. I mean, they're both, they're incredible. They're both so good. Um, it's a great publishing company, run by women. Yes, entrepreneurial, smart. Yes, just super gracious people. I'm 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 a big fan of oh, them. Oh, I'm them. so they're both thrilled great. to be with them, and it yeah. really is a woman pat over there. Yeah, it's incredible. So in this next segment. We're going to do five for five. I'm going to list five things and just tell me oh, something. Yeah. Okay. Let's go with, let's go with Graham mm-hmm. first. So yeah, tell me something. I'm just going to list five. Graham, I'm just totally grateful to him for being my friend, uh, my wingman through the music business. We set off from England together, came to America I feel like we we really made it together in the music business. Yeah. And uh, he's so talented, such a, a great songwriter, great bass player, um, amazing dad. Just, you know, a good pal to let's, this day. Let's go with Avril Lavigne. Avril is like, that's my sister in Christ. And we, the stuff we created together, I'm just so proud of it. I'm with you. I still sit at the piano and, and play so it. so good. And uh, love her dearly. Uh Bibi Rexa. Bibi's another sister. You know, from the moment we met, I spotted her genius. And the two of us just have so much fun when we work together. It's it's really, it's like a therapy session, the two of us. Sometimes we talk for two hours before we write the song. And uh, I, I've just really, really enjoyed everything I've done with her. Let's go with your husband. My husband, Lawrence. Oh, there's so much to say about Lawrence. We, By the way, I met him at... A Sona event. Yes. Um, you're also an advocate, so yes. feel Love free Michelle. to lump all of this stuff oh, together. Gosh. Well, I mean, my husband Lawrence, I would say, is my muse because he's so incredible, incredibly poetic. He's my best friend. He's my husband. He's the stepfather to my children. He's really helped me so much with raising girls because he's raised girls. <laughs> And um, he, we just have an incredible time because he pretty much oversees everything for me in the music business. What about, um, this wasn't going to be my fifth, but we since you mentioned Michelle and we're friends with Michelle Lewis and we're friends with Sona, it's, yeah. I'm what, just you're, grateful to them. Yeah. I'm grateful and to you and to all the people who've who've gone to bat for songwriters because it's a very difficult time. Yeah. It's a very, very difficult time. Yeah. Um, this wasn't going to. My last one is more because of the conversations we've had, and you've alluded to it. But <laughs> I, my fifth person is Jesus. <laughs> okay, go um, for it. Oh my gosh! Well, I don't want to go on too much, but you know, since I turned my life over to Jesus, and I would say pretty radically got saved. One day, I'll, I'll write a very small three-page book about my my hmm. journey of coming to Jesus because it was pretty amazing. Um, I'd like to thank Shai Carter for helping me huh? come to Jesus. And and there's is there's power in forgiveness. Um being forgiven by God, but also forgiving other people who've hurt you. It's it's an incredible thing, the freedom of forgiveness. And it really changed my life. And I'm so happy. I have yeah. to tell you that I really am a very happy person because of it. And yeah. I and it's pretty cool that I had till forty two without it, and then to know what the last 10 years has been with him. Yeah. And praise God, that's all I have to say. It's wonderful. Well, thank you for doing this. Thank you so much, Ross. You know, it's a, 
there aren't that many people that you see in in a studio where you run up and you just give a hug first, <laughs> you know, and or at a at a one year old birthday party a week ago or wherever I see I you, it's that. like I see you everywhere, and it's like I I want to give you a hug and and because you're you're such a positive person, and it's you know, let alone the fact that you've been able to weather this storm of the music business. Mm-hmm. From the beginning, and if you're talking about the beginning of your career, it's it's from CDs till now, and you're still having number one hits. You're still having hits. You're still <laughs> writing with great artists across the board, and you do it with such positivity. It's like it gives hope for all of us to be like, yeah, you can enjoy this. You don't have to. You don't have to hate the music industry and be in it. And there, I think a lot of people naturally complain about the music business and yes it's not to say we're void of complaining about the music business but you can actually really enjoy being a professional songwriter and mm-hmm. and you live by that i do love it and you know one of the things lawrence always says to me is what you do is not who you are and at first mm. i was like well hang on a second that's who i am i'm a songwriter and then i realized yeah. that you know the people who really love me they don't really love my songs they love me you know, and so after a while, I was like, okay, I, I really go and I give my all when I'm there. And then I come home and I give my all to my family and work on that just as hard as the music. That's probably the best lesson that, that you can give out of this whole thing is that I, I've learned that from my wife, too. It's a similar thing. It's like, what you do is really it's for your own ego, whatever that is. But when you come home, not everybody wants to hear everything. And if they do, it's like because they love you and because they support you and they may like the music. But yeah, what you do is not who you are. It's, mm-hmm. it's an amazing lesson. So thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you for having me, Ross. Thanks for listening to this episode of And the Writer Is. If you want to hear music from this songwriter I just interviewed, be sure to check out our Spotify playlist or visit our website at andthewriteris.com. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe to us. You can also like us on Facebook and Twitter. And the Writer Is is produced by Joe London, edited by Miles Bergsma, and published by Big Deal Music. A special thanks to David Silberstein from Mega House Music and Michael White. Until next time, this is Ross Golan.